No, it's all good. I've got everything I need here. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, oh, there we go. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you follow Jenna Jameson normally, but... Um, uh, well, actually, I do know how you follow her, but... Um, uh, boy, just on something Reese said, uh, you know, about uh, if you masturbate, you, you're gay. Jo uh, boy George was on the, the View, you know, the show The View, and uh, he was talking about uh, writing his musical. And uh, he was doing it with Rosie O'Donnell, and uh, he said, "Well, you know, but uh, you don't have to be gay to like it. I mean, everybody's gay, really." And um, one of the one of the women said, well, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, if you masturbate, you've had gay sex." And it was such a great way he put it on that show. And they were all laughing except for the uh, Elizabeth Hasselbeck. <laughs> yeah, she was she was not down with the boy George uh, interpretation. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty funny moment. But uh, anyway, I've got a, b a bunch of stuff here. Um, I. I love when you find bad books, and um, uh, there's a, there are many, so many to choose from. In fact, I was thinking about William McGonagall, who's the great uh, poet. He's been read here before, um, but he was he was uh, he's considered the worst poet ever <laughs> in the history of poetry, and his stuff is truly, truly bad. Um, uh, but um, you know. I saw that he'd been done, so I was looking for things, and I went to a couple of old bookstores, you know, you look around and you say, well, you know, that looks likely, or that looks likely, and some of them look pretty obvious, but I, th I thought, well, what, what, what will I find? And I found a couple of things, and in fact, I also found something from my library, which my mother said, oh, you could read The Eskimo Twins, one of the worst books ever written, <laughs> and I still have it from my childhood. Um, but um, I did find a couple of gems. One is the X-Files book. The X-Files novel. Does anybody remember the X-Files? Well, when I came, when I came to Vancouver, um, I came here as a lean on a US TV series called The Net. And we opened the night the X-Files closed. And so we had a big party. So I was never one of the X-Files guys, so I figure I can read this without too much trouble. Um, and one of the things that you get in bad writing, like truly bad writing, is when it tries to be cleverer than it is or it tries to overstate its case. And there's some descriptive things in this. I've got a couple of nuggets that really uh, take the cake. Um, then there's another uh, novel that I found on the same detective theme. And it was written in 1973 or 74, and it's called Marilyn the Wild by Jerome Sharon and this guy's yes yeah, yeah exactly and this guy's his descriptions go off and say I think he was on acid when he wrote this and he and he he must have dictated it and then someone else typed it up because it goes all over the place and it's about a New York City detective in London and then Paris and all these places and it's all about it's a, a second by second interpretation of what he's taking in while he's describing the story um, and it's um, it's it's got some pretty uh, crazy stuff. Um, so we'll look through that. Um, but I want to start with something a little unusual, which is um, a book from 1948 or 49 called England Today in Pictures. <laughs> and um, it's, uh, it's a rather special book. It's, got, it's, it's all pictures, in, and the England it shows, you really think it's from 1914 or 19, you know, 1920 maybe. And um, you realize that it was only about 10 years later that the Beatles sprang on England, and as John Lennon once said, that when they, they arrived, it was like four Martians arriving from outer space when they hit England. And if you look at it, how many people have seen A Hard Day's Night? Well, A Hard Day's Night, the Beatles are the only guys that are, they are aliens, they're not like anybody else there, and it's like an old England, and this book's that old England, and um, in the introduction there's some really, really purple passages here about, um, about the English nature, and um, so I've got something to read this with. Um, uh, and, and we'll talk about the English character as he's trying to describe it for those who are not aware of England. And uh, so I've got a little piece of music and I've got a bowler hat here, so. <laughs> and uh, uh, here we go. Let's see. <laughs> but with all these differences of habit and speech, English people from north to south and east to west have one thing in common. They will not permit anyone to throw his weight about unduly, no matter what his wealth or how high his position. Thus, when Hitler began his fascist salute, the London taxi drivers hailed each other with an inderision. That did a lot. Years before the war, when the newsreel showed Mussolini strutting across the cinema screen, audiences in town and country greeted him with derisive laughter. That did a lot. They subject their own 
all leaders to the same salutary discipline. The colonel, the sergeant major, and the mother-in-law are traditional figures of fun on their music hall stage. They elect a town council and thereafter refer to them in conversation as the town scoundrels. That did a lot. <laughs> Should any politician, even after a proven success, get a trifle too big for his boots, the English will immediately vote against him and even their political convictions. For their chief conviction, and one that they will never relinquish, it is the moment that any person shows what he thinks he cannot be done without. He must be done without, lest worse befall. The whole book goes on like this. About the great <laughs> right? now, um, there's, a, oh, there's a bit of a monarchy here. Hang on. So, um, here we go. Um, so, today the relationship between the king and the people is a very friendly thing. The English folk town is the keystone of life, it, be it castle or cottage, mansion or bungalow. Therefore, to them, Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle is merely a king's home. The house where an Englishman lives with his wife and brings up his family. The two princesses are his children and every commoner in England appreciated that these two children stayed in England throughout the war and that the royal family shared with the people the dangers of the Blitz. Now, this is him just talking about the King and Queen of England before he gets into the people. Um, and so he's going on about, that is why the home of democracy and freedom keeps its monarchy. The pe yes, that's why, apparently, because they stayed at home during the war and they live in a castle. Uh, uh, um, and so, so once again, England mixes the new and the old with charming and efficient fashion. In his Christmas broadcast, the king naturally uses the phrase, my people, while the poorest mother in the land looks upon the two princes, princesses as my body children, and is interested in their welfare as in her own children's. And Beethoven doesn't agree with that either. <laughs> All right, so that was that's, uh, the plummy the plummy stuff. This book is a remarkable read. Um, there was there's one about. Um, uh, hang on, just let me find it here. Uh, okay, well, we'll, we'll skip on. So that, that anyway, that's a little bit of England, a little touch of England in the purple prose. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, should we read from the X-Files next? Should we do the X-Files next? Right. Uh, put, put on my cool X-Files hat here. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I should have had a, 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 what, the, um, the Mulder wig, you know? <laughs> Actually, I was, I, was playing a, I was playing an Alan Rickman character in a film, and I'd had my head shaved for another role, and so I had to have the hair because we had to match what we shot before. And so they, they, got, they got me a wig um, that, that I could look Alan Rickman-ish in. And um, the, uh, the, wig, the wig woman said, um, you know, um, this was David Duchovny's hair. And I said, oh, really? I, thought he, I, thought, I didn't know he needed hair. Oh, he had his, his, his head was you know, ch cut short for something. I had to match it, so we had to make hair like David's. So this is David's hair. And I said, oh, am I going to start hitting on extras and uh, starting fights in the NAM later <laughs> She liked it, but she didn't think that was funny. All right, um, okay, so uh, Mulder and uh, and um, uh, Scully are, are doing. Uh, they're on the search for uh, these mysterious. There's this mysterious uh, deaths going on, and they go at one point. They're taken to an old folks' home to to find somebody who's got information they need. Scully and Mulder walk through the recreation room at Baltimore Lynn Acres Retirement Home. A group of residents was gathered around a TV watching a game show. Most were in wheelchairs. Nearly all of them looked to be at least 80 years old. The whole building smelled of old age. <laughs> what? This kind of smells like hipster Main Street to me, don't you? I don't know. What does your house smell like? I mean, it all smelled of old age. Oh my God. Scully glanced at the group, then quickly looked away. Places like this made her feel sad. Would they find a clue here in the case of Eugene Toombs, she wondered. An attendant came up to them. I just checked for you, she said. Frank Briggs is upstairs in his apartment. Number, uh, number 793. He's expecting you. Thank you, Scully said. Five minutes later, she and Mulder stood in the seventh floor hallway in front of Briggs' apartment. The door was slightly ajar. Mulder knocked. Come on in, a hoarse voice said from inside. Scully led the way into a tiny studio apartment. A double bed covered with an orange spread took up most of the room. A lamp and a cheap pendulum clock sat on a tall dresser in front of a window. The clock ticked loudly. The walls gave testimony to Briggs' career as a police officer. How? <laughs> Scully noted a photograph of a police squad and a certificate of merit. 
Frank Biggs sat in a wheelchair near a window. He had to be about 85. He had to be? I don't know. The, the, the writing is like this all the way through it. It's terrible phrasing. Okay? Um, he was dressed casually in an open neck yellow shirt that pulled tightly over his stomach. Scully studied the retired detective's face. He had white hair, a mustache, and the crooked, swollen nose of a man who'd been in more than one fight. Beyond gold wire rim glasses, his blue eyes were still sharp. So this goes on and on and on. It's like overly descriptive, like crazy. Because basically, she, the writer, this woman, um, Ellen Stiber, took this, as it says, based on the teleplay written by Glenn Morgan and James Wong. So she's basically tried to put into descriptive terms all of the stuff you actually see on the TV. Um, so uh, there's, there's, a, there's a great description of a fight here, uh, of an argument. So um, here we go, let's see. Um, Basically, um, Mulder and, and uh, Scully are having an argument with, with a guy named Colton. So, um, Colton says, let's run a check on liver transplants in the next 24 hours, Colton ordered. Maybe this is black market, someone who's making money selling livers to people who are desperate for a transplant. <laughs> Johnson was not impressed by this theory. In fact, he wasn't impressed by Colton. Come on, he said impatiently, you gotta be kidding. At this point, I'll give any theory a shot, so Colton snapped. He ran a hand wearily through his hair. Any sane theory, that is. Colton looked even more stressed, and Scully and Mulder passed the outside guard and entered the house. Colton stepped toward them quickly. I'm sorry, Dana, he said, but I only want qualified members of the investigating team at the scene. What's the matter, Colton? Mulder said softly. Are you worried that I'm going to solve your case? Mulder started toward the body. Colton reached out and grabbed his arm. Mulder remained calm, but he gave Colton a glance to let him know he had no authority to touch another agent. Colton let go of Mulder almost at once. Almost at once. At once or almost at once? Almost at once. That's almost as better than at once, don't you think? Huh? Almost at once. Yeah, yeah. I got the arm. Hey, give me another look, buddy. I kind of like it. Give me more screen time. Hey, all right. All right? But still, he continued to block his path. Now, that's just an actor trying to get more screen time. We all know this. This guy, Colton, is a one-day player, and he's trying to get as much time as he can. So when she's taking this from the teleplay, and she's seen him hold it there and not let go, of, you know, you know Mulder, it's like, and he's stepping in as he's doing this whole thing on the, the camera. We know what that's all about. You know? I say, you know, an old trick, we do, if, you, if you want to keep more face time on camera, and all the old stars know it is, if you have a cigarette, you lift the cigarette halfway through the other guy talking, and you pull on it slowly, and then you pull it down. So that when they cut back to you, they never saw the cigarette go there, so they're going to give you all the time to raise the cigarette. Huh? And take it down. And so, poor guy, day player, is doing his big speech, he's crying his heart out, and he gets like a second and a half of screen time. Because the other actor's going, yeah. Yeah, that's bad. All right. That's acting trick number 155. All right. Scully stepped between the two men. Tom, we have authorized access to this crime scene, she told her former classmate. <laughs> Where did that come from? Her former classmate. That's, and on, on screen, that's really going to read. Hey! Remember at school? You know? All right. Neither Mulder nor Colton moved. It was definitely a standoff. Screen time. Scully knew it was up to her to break it. Unfortunately, Colton was every bit as stubborn as Mulder. Now, this guy is a good player. This is a good actor, okay? He's, he's milked this tiny part for all he can get, right? Huh? But here's the best part. She had, she had one weapon to use against Colton. The only thing he really cared about, his career. Tom, she said in a firm voice, a report of your obstructing another officer's investigation might stick out in your personnel file. It might stick out in your personnel file. We know it's sticking out in his personnel file. It's the chance that every time he gets on camera, he's like... All right. Colton's eyes flashed at her, and Scully knew their friendship was over. <laughs> okay, how do you flash your eyes? All right? What do we do? You look at it, he's already glaring at her, his eyes are probably like this. Because he, he said the career word, like, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And then his eyes flash at her. Like, what is that? It's a CGI effect. Uh -huh. You know, the terminology of this is ridiculous. But he stepped aside to let Mulder examine the crime scene. Because, God damn it, it's only a one hour episode. We gotta get moving. We gotta get in there. Then Colton turned to Scully, his voice, his voice low and furious. Then Colton turned to Scully, his voice low and furious. Tell me something, Dana, he said. Whose side are you on? 
Well, she's just trying to get the episode finished. And then she turns to him and says, the victims. So she left Colton and went to see what the police officer had found for her. So anyway, all through this description of this book, it's got these crazy flashes of, of terrible overriding, and then it's got trying to describe something they've seen on the finished movie and, uh, and, and put it into, into, to, into words. And there's a million versions of it, but I'm just going to move on uh, because that's the X Files for you overwrought and overwritten. And, you know, and, you know when, I, when I came to Vancouver, uh, one of the things that was said, you know, I came from Toronto and, uh, you know, wildly sort of divergent uh, things going on in Toronto at the time and, you know, doing a lot of theatre and so on, but um, there's a, there was a thing that X-Files had taken over all the acting in this city, so that was, everyone had to do, like, kind of mumbling. <laughs> like, like, little acting, no, 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 little, little thoughts. You know, you could, and, and it would even say in block capitals, the guy screams, you know, let me out of here, you bastards, and you'd, and you'd have to go, let me out of here, you bastards. <laughs> because if you, if you went, let me out! They go, whoa, whoa, too big, oh, oh, no, 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 this is, it's not theater, man, it's like, and, and casting directors would say, to your agent, say, um, we, uh, we saw Mac today, he's a little big, okay, he's like, a, woo, you know, he's got, he's got to take it down, he's got to learn how to act in, you know, film, and then my agent, quite rightly, when that was said, said, he's done 150 movies and 14 television series, I think, was he wrong, you know, so, they, we, and we learned it was the X-Files factor, so the X-Files factor was, keep me alone, mumble. Don't emote. Don't say that. And this book takes that and then puts it into big words, right? It's, and all through this book, there's about 20 instances that I handle on, which were Mulder's eyes widened with amazement, or Scully's eyes widened. And it's like, how do you widen your eyes? You can open your eyes, but how do you widen your eyes? I've been trying, I've been trying it in the mirror all day. It's like, I don't know. Uh, so, okay, what? We don't have time. Okay, well, you know what? I will save these choice pieces, <laughs> these choice pieces for next time, all right? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe next time I'll find, uh, what, what's a good TV series that would be turned into a book? What would be a good one? You know, think of, a, think of one that would be too impossible to describe. Firefly. Firefly? Lost Girl. Lost Girl, Lost Girl, yeah. Lost Girl? Okay, I'll see if there's a Lost Girl book. I'll find it. All right. Thanks.